Frozen ground doesn't feel cold. It steals heat. For poor medieval peasants, winter was not about snow or beauty. It was about sleeping on damp, frozen earth with too few blankets and losing warmth hour after hour whether they moved or not. The ground pulled heat from their bodies without pause. Children lost it faster, and once that heat was gone, there was no easy way to bring it back. They didn't survive these nights by getting warmer. They survived by understanding where heat was lost and how to slow that loss layer by layer. This wasn't comfort, it was survival. And it began with one decision, to get their bodies off the frozen ground. Night settles early across rural medieval Europe. Inside a poor peasant house, the air feels still, but the danger is not in the wind. It is beneath the body. The floor is packed earth, darkened by moisture from days of rain, frozen just enough to feel hard and solid under weight. It does not give warmth. It takes it. When a body lies directly on frozen ground, heat is lost by conduction, slow, steady, and relentless. Warmth drains from the core and disappears into the soil, minute by minute pulled away without noise or mercy. For children, it happens faster. Smaller bodies, less stored heat, almost no margin for error. Poor medieval peasants learn this through experience, not theory. They watch shivering turn to stillness. They felt the ground win night after night, and they learned something else just as clearly. You do not need a bed to survive. You need separation from the ground. They used whatever was available. Straw left behind after the harvest. Branches trimmed from hedges and fence lines. Old planks reused until they split. Bundles of rushes cut from wet fields and dried as best they could. Anything that could lift a body even a few centimeters above the earth. This was not comfort. It was heat management. Archaeology supports this quietly. Across medieval peasant houses in England and northern France, floor deposits often include compacted straw and other organic traces, material hints of bedding, laid down where people actually lived and slept. Not furniture, not decoration, a functional barrier between flesh and soil. That small gap mattered. Air trapped beneath the body slowed conduction. Heat loss dropped. The ground stopped pulling warmth so quickly. The change was subtle. No sudden relief. No deep sleep. But core temperature stabilized. Breathing slowed. Shivering eased just enough. The night became survivable. Poor medieval peasants did not lift themselves off the ground to sleep better. They did it to stay above the point where the body can no longer recover lost heat. And once the ground stopped winning so easily, they turned their attention to the floor itself. Lifting the body off the ground slowed the damage, but the floor itself remained cold, damp, unforgiving. For poor medieval peasants, a bare earth floor was never neutral. It was a thermal sink. Moist soil pulled heat out of the room, then out of the body quietly, steadily, without pause. No matter how still, a person laid the floor, kept drawing warmth away. Stripping the floor bare didn't help. If anything, it exposed more cold earth and made heat loss faster. Instead of fighting the floor, they changed how it worked. They layered it. Straw left from the harvest. Chaff swept from threshing floors. Rushes cut from wet ground and dried just enough to use. Whatever plant material could trap air and break contact with the soil, these layers were spread thick across the living space. Not replaced daily, allowed to build up season after season. This was not disorder, it was insulation. Archaeology confirms it quietly. Excavations of medieval peasant houses across England and northern France reveal deep compacted floor deposits, organic material mixed with soil compressed by countless footsteps, not swept away, deliberately added to, each layer trapped air, each layer slowed the movement of cold rising from the ground, moisture dispersed instead of pooling beneath the body. 
heat lingered longer inside the room. The change was never dramatic. No sudden warmth, no luxury. But the loss slowed. Body heat lasted longer between breaths. The room stopped feeling like it was draining warmth continuously. The margin between life and hypothermia widened. Clean floors were a luxury poor medieval peasants could not afford. Insulated floors were something they could not survive without. And still, insulation alone was not enough. Blankets were shared, thin, worn. Warmth had to come from the bodies themselves. Insulation slowed the loss, but it could not create warmth. And blankets were never enough. In poor medieval peasant households, heat had to come from bodies, and bodies worked best together. This was not preference, it was physics. A child loses heat faster than an adult. Less mass, more surface area relative to size. Less margin when the temperature drops. Sleeping apart meant losing heat alone. Sleeping together changed the equation. Poor medieval peasants arranged sleep deliberately. Children were placed in the center, adults on the outside. Bodies pressed close, forming a single thermal mass instead of many small ones. Blankets were shared, not divided. One covering trapped heat from multiple bodies instead of leaking it through gaps. What little warmth existed stayed concentrated where it mattered most. Household accounts, later descriptions, and practical parallels all suggest the same pattern heat was shared because it had to be. The result was not rest. It was stabilization. Heat accumulated within the group. Children's body temperatures dropped more slowly. The night shifted from immediately dangerous to barely manageable. There was no privacy, no personal space, only survival math. Once bodies were arranged this way, something else changed. Movement slowed. Energy use dropped. Less warm air was pumped into the cold. Shared heat did not make the room warm. It made heat harder to lose. That difference mattered. It was the line between waking up cold and not waking up at all. Still even shared warmth had limits. Thin blankets failed first. Cold seeped through fabric. Fabric thinned, gaps opened, and cold found its way in. So poor medieval peasants turned to the one layer that never left them through the night. By this point, every blanket was already in use, thin, worn down by years of work, shared between bodies. When the cold pressed harder, there was nothing left to add. So poor medieval peasants turned to the one layer that never left them through the night their clothing. In medieval households, clothes were not removed at bedtime. They were kept on carefully. Wool tunics, cloaks pulled tight, hoods drawn over the head and neck. Anything that could trap air close to the skin. This was not discomfort. It was design. Wool mattered more than anything else. Unlike linen wool, retained warmth even when damp. Its fibers trapped pockets of air, slowed heat loss, and continued to insulate when moisture crept in from the ground or breath condensed in the cold darkness. Archaeological textile finds across medieval Europe reflect this reality. Peasant clothing evidence shows wool again and again, not because of fashion or status, but because wool worked when nothing else did. Poor medieval peasants slept fully dressed. Layers overlapped instead of separating. Belts stayed fastened. Openings were sealed to reduce heat loss from the head, neck, and waist. The bed was no longer a place. It became the body itself. This did not create warmth. It preserved what little remained. Heat stayed closer to the core. Cold took longer to reach the skin. Shivering eased just enough. There was no softness, no ease, only a smaller rate of loss, but the night became possible. Clothing and bedding were never separate systems. They worked together or failed together. Even then, warmth was fragile. Every movement pumped heat into the surrounding air. Every gap leaked energy into the dark. So, once the body was layered and still poor, medieval peasants made one more adjustment, not to gain warmth, but to protect every remaining degree. By full nightfall, fire could no longer be trusted. Wood was scarce. 
Relighting a hearth demanded fuel effort and attention, three things poor medieval peasants could not afford to waste once darkness settled in. So they stopped chasing warmth and began protecting what they already had. This was the final shift, and it mattered more than any step before it. Fire was used early in the evening, not through the night. Archaeological evidence from peasant dwellings supports this restraint. Hearth remains often show limited or inconsistent use after dark. There are rarely thick ash layers from fires kept burning until morning. Few signs of constant overnight heat. When the fire died, behavior changed. Movement slowed. The usable space of the house shrank. Families withdrew into corners, alcoves, and wall edges. The most sheltered parts of the structure where air stayed still and heat lingered longer. Warmth was treated like a resource. Not something to spend freely, but something to guard. Bodies stayed close. Layers remained sealed. Unnecessary motion stopped because movement pushed warm air away from the body and into the cold. Even breathing changed. Slower. Shallower. Each breath carried away less heat. This was not comfort. It was discipline. By reducing exposed surface area and minimizing air movement, heat loss slowed again. The cold did not disappear. It pressed in from every side, but it stopped winning so quickly. This final adjustment did not make the house warm. It kept bodies above the threshold where recovery was still possible, above the point where shivering turns into failure and exhaustion becomes dangerous. Morning did not arrive with relief or victory. It arrived quietly, not because the night had been conquered, but because it had been endured deliberately. That was the complete system. Lift the body off the ground, insulate the floor, share heat between bodies, turn clothing into bedding, and finally protect every remaining degree. Poor medieval peasants did not survive winter nights by fighting the cold. They survived by controlling loss. And sometimes that was enough. Poor medieval peasants did not survive winter nights because they had warmth. They survived because they understood loss. They knew the ground would steal heat. That air could be trapped. That bodies worked better together. That fire was precious and movement expensive. Nothing they did was comfortable. Everything they did was deliberate. Today, when the power goes out, we wait for systems to turn back on. Thermostats, heaters, blankets. When they fail, we feel exposed. They had no switch to flip. So they learned instead. Survival in the end was not about staying warm. It was about staying warm enough long enough to see morning. And this was only one kind of night. One kind of cold. There are others waiting.